What's up? I'm Hutch, and you need to better understand incomplete spinal cord injuries so that you can determine your patient's level of function and also pass the NPTE. There are a few more common incomplete spinal cord injuries that you might come across. Anterior cord syndrome can occur from a flexion injury or from an infarction at the anterior spinal artery, and this will affect the front two-thirds of the spinal cord. This means that the corticospinal tract or all motor function, as well as the spinothalamic tract, which will be pain and temperature, below the level of injury will be affected. The likelihood that these patients will have respiratory and bowel function decreased highly increases the patient's risk for death. Posterior cord syndrome can occur from an infarction at one of two posterior spinal arteries. So this is a little bit less likely because you have one that will kind of cover up for the other one if it's affected. With this injury, it's mostly only the back third of the spinal cord that's affected, which is basically just the dorsal columns. So light touch, proprioception, and vibration below the level of injury will be affected. Central cord syndrome can occur through a hyperextension injury, such as in a fall or a motor vehicle accident. With this injury, the middle part of the spinal cord is the most affected, meaning that upper extremity motor function is going to be more significantly affected than lower extremity. There may be other tracts that are also affected by this injury, and it'll depend on the severity and placement of the injury itself, which is true for all of these spinal cord injuries. If you're having trouble remembering how any of these three injuries presents, just picture a cross section of the spinal cord, and then you can kind of figure out from there what areas are going to be more affected. Now again, when you're seeing these patients in real life, there's a lot of variability to these injuries, which is going to affect the presentation. Now with a brown saccard injury, these usually occur from a stab wound that affects only the left or right side of the spinal cord. So rather than having a bilateral presentation, which is what those other three injuries are, now you only have one side of the spinal cord that's affected. So with this, if the corticospinal or dorsal columns are affected, then you'll see symptoms on the ipsilateral side of the body below the level of injury. However, if the spinothalamic tract is affected, you're going to see its effect on the contralateral side because this tract crosses over at the spinal cord. Cauda equina injuries are those that happen below L1, L2 after the spinal cord ends, and it's just at that bundle of peripheral nerves, so it's no longer a central nervous system injury. Here, chance for recovery is much less likely. When you have those nerves bundled up so tightly within the spinal cord, at least some of the nerves have a chance of reconnecting to the higher levels. But with the cauda equina, those nerves start to spread out very soon, and so the chance of them reconnecting to the higher part is unlikely. These injuries will usually lead to flaccidity, uh, areflexic bowels, loss of all spinal reflexes, as well as loss of saddle sensation. Now it's time for NPTE Jeopardy! Pause the video now if you want time to read and think about the question. Otherwise, you've got five, four, three, two, one. The corticospinal tract is arranged with the upper body closest to the center of the spinal cord, like the spinothalamic tract, and unlike the dorsal columns. Central cord syndrome affects the center of the spinal cord first, with decreasing symptoms more laterally. Hopefully that covers all of our bases, if not, you can always check out the description box below for a link to my notes on Etsy, or you can comment with questions or suggestions for videos I should do in the future. Otherwise, good luck study and go change the world!